He left notes on my car, he's harassed me at my workplace, he harassed my colleagues. He once left a will on my doorstep saying he was going to kill himself and make it look like an accident and I would have to sit with the reality that like I had forced him to do this. The day of our court trial, he showed up at my house uh, and said, get in the car and come with me and tell them no or else you're not coming home. So I acquiesced because I wanted to live. And I'm Jake Diptula. On today's episode of Strictly Stalking, we're chatting with Julie S. Lalonde. She's an internationally recognized women's rights advocate, public educator, and author. Julie is a frequent media source on issues of violence against women, Al Jazeera, CBC's The National, TVO's The Agenda, and Vice. She's worked to create a sexual assault center at her alma mater, Carleton University, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Her book, Resilience is Futile, The Life and Death and Life of Julie S. Lalonde, recounts Julie's desperate attempt to escape her abusive ex-boyfriend at the age of 20 and his 10 years of stalking that followed. Hi, Julie. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, um, who you are, what you do. Yeah, so as you said, I am based in Ottawa, Canada, and I spend my life working to make the world safer for women and girls. I do work on bystander intervention, um, and I train people ages 12 and up on how to prevent and respond to issues of violence against women. And this work is my passion, um, but it's also a result of my personal experience. Um, So I come at it as someone who's been doing this work for almost 20 years uh, and someone who lived it for quite a long time. So how did you get involved in this? I actually started doing this work while I was in an abusive relationship and didn't put the two together. I just was the first person in my family to go to university. I moved to this big city and I had a, felt a real sense of responsibility to do something meaningful with my education. And so just in kind of word of mouth, I heard about some incredible local organizations doing work um, to you know counsel women who had been sexually assaulted, um, organize some rallies and just sort of dipped my toe in a little bit as a volunteer um, and discovered that that's where my passion was, that I could use my voice in a really um, productive way. And the rest is history. Tell us how you met your stalker. We actually went to high school together. So all through high school, I dated someone else who was very lovely, very kind, still is. Um, And throughout that time, I had a friend and his name was Xavier. And we were just really, really good friends. And sometimes people would joke that he had a crush on me. Um, but I just thought, no, like we're friends. And I remember being kind of like a little bit like going on little feminist rants about like, you know, women and men can be friends with each other. Like that doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be weird. And so I really didn't see him as anything but my friend. Uh, and then when high school was over, I decided to break up with my boyfriend because I wanted to move away and just be single and concentrate on school. And, you know, I dated someone all through high school. Like I basically had never been single and Within moments of me breaking up with my boyfriend, Xavier declared his undying love for me, told me he had been in love with me for years, um, and really felt like he'd been kind of put in the friend zone, just waiting in the wings, and that, you know, this was his moment to show me that he had been kind of basically waiting for me that whole time. Um, And that's when things transitioned from friends to dating. What was your early courtship with him like? It was really, really wonderful. And I think it's really important for when I talk about my story for people to know that because I think sometimes we really think, you know, we we, we think we're really woke and progressive and like with it, but I think we still have these ideas in our head of like, but like what kind of woman ends up with these people? Like, shouldn't they know that this person's a jerk or like a monster or whatever? And there was no indication at the start that that was what he was like at all. Like we had a wonderful summer before I moved away. Um, he was, and still is probably the most spontaneous person I've ever met. Like he was always down to have a good time, um, was always down for like some random adventure, was very attentive, was very affectionate. And I remember being taken aback by that, that, you know, we're 18 years old and here's this like straight guy, like unashamed to tell people that he's in love with me. Um, and I thought that was just so romantic and so lovely. And that was confirmed by the people around me who thought like, oh my God, what a catch. Um, And the fact that you guys were friends first, like you've already built up this trust, like this is just the ideal kind of perfect scenario. So you didn't see any like red flags coming because you'd known him quite a while. 
Yeah, so, I mean, in retrospect, I now see that, like, oh, I remember when, so I went to high school in a very strict context. It was, um, uh, in Canada, Catholic schools, depending on where you live, are actually publicly funded. So I went to a publicly funded school that was run by nuns, very strict uniform, very strict rules, like, just the strictest of the strict. Um, and so one of the things that the guys at my school would do is they would try to pull up women's skirts because we had to wear skirts as part of our uniform. And he was kind of the worst antagonizer for that. And I remember friends complaining to me that like, oh my God, like he's always doing this to me or he's always trying to like grab my ass in the hallway. And me just really believing what we're told, which is like, ugh, like that's what guys do when they like you and they just want attention. Like don't give them the attention. Uh, and so looking back on it now, I'm like, okay, you know, didn't respect women's boundaries. That's a flag. Um, was very into me from the jump. Like, that's a flag. Um, but at the time, people around me just saw it as like, what a beautiful, you know, high school sweetheart kind of story. Like, I just was flattered that this guy was so into me. At no point did it feel then um, suffocating. That summer, it felt lovely like I was just like walking on clouds everything was lovely so when did things start to turn in the relationship if you had asked me that a few months ago I would have told you oh you know we were together for like about a year before things like really started to go sideways but it's only in going back and looking at old journals and I've always been someone who kept a journal and going back and looking at that and thinking oh my god he was it was like weeks uh, into him moving into my apartment that things went sideways, not months. Um, and so it's interesting how your memory kind of wants you to believe things. But um, we spent that summer together living with our parents back home. It was wonderful. I moved away in September, tried to break up with him. And he insisted, no, 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 we can make long distance work. I didn't want to do long distance again. I wanted to be single. But I just really felt like I've already broken one person's heart this summer. Xavier might be my soulmate and like what am I doing throwing that away so we'll just try doing long distance and that didn't last very long he showed up at my house which was about six hours away um, and just insisted that he move in with me he couldn't live without me um, and very shortly after that I started to see oh okay this this deep passion is in fact obsession um, and he now is able to control every single thing I do because we share a bedroom um, in this apartment. How long were you living together and what, what was daily life like living with him? We lived together for about two years. Um, initially it was him and I and my brother and some roommates, like just like a typical college experience of like a bunch of people who are broke <laughs> living together. Um, and the roommates that I was living with and my brother just got really into partying and like just didn't care about school. Um, and I didn't want to move out because I was, I, I kind of had like a sense that like, I feel like when it's just me and Xavier, things are going to get worse. Um, but I felt so trapped and I was like, okay, well, I really care about my education and I, I want to be able to study and like live my life. So I ended up moving in just with him. Um, and that was just, I mean, it was heinous. Like he would monitor every single thing I was doing. And again, this is like early 2000s. Like this was long before like cell phones were like big brick Zach Morris phones, you know, like no one was texting. It was like a dollar to send a text, you know, like there was no social media. So like to keep tabs on someone then was actually a lot of work. <laughs> so he was like physically, you know, checking, okay, she has class that ends here. The bus should take this long. Why is she not home yet? And then I would get scolded when I came home. Where were you? He, I thought was being nice and got me a job, but it was at the mall where he worked. And I soon realized like, oh, it's just a way for him to keep tabs on me all the time. Um, and so he was never physically abusive, I think in large part because I'm like six feet tall and he was smaller than I am, but he was very abusive sexually. Um, so I, like routinely was sexually assaulted when we lived together, he financially controlled every single thing that we did. And at the time framed it as like, I work full time and you're a student, so I'll take care of our finances, which turned into you have to ask me permission to, you know, buy a coffee at Starbucks. So it just was like really, I think of it as like tightening the grip and it just like his grip got tighter and tighter and my world just got really, really small. Um, and by the time we were at about two years, I was just like, this is going to kill me if I don't get out. When did you make that decision to leave? 
Uh, it took me two tries. Um, but when I eventually, so I tried to break up with him in the spring and he did, you know, the typical convinced me that things would change. And I never framed it as I'm leaving you because you're abusive or I'm leaving you because you're scaring me. It was very much, you're not supporting my dreams. I feel like you're not letting me spread my wings. And that's the whole point of me going to school and moving away. And he, you know, said all the things I needed to hear. Um, and, but things immediate, like maybe a week later, he went back to his old ways. And I finally just kind of snapped when I felt like I had evidence that he had been cheating on me. And for some reason, that was like the line that I wasn't willing to tolerate. Um, and it also, I think, gave me permission almost. Like it was like, okay, well, no one's going to blame me for breaking up with him because he cheated on me. Um, and so I was basically sobbing to my dad on the phone and he said, you know, um, Xavier's gone for the weekend now's your chance you need to go like we've we're not happy with how he treats you um so take your stuff and leave uh and that's what i did what was your plan for leaving how did you implement it i mean looking back on it now i'm just like i do not know like someone was looking out for me because it was like six o'clock on a sunday and by 6 a.m the next morning i was packed up and crashing on someone's couch so i really just sent out kind of an sos call to my friends again old school like physically calling my friends and saying I have to go and I am still so emotional when I think about how grateful I am that like nobody questioned it like nobody was just like and if they were shocked if they did question it they didn't show it to me they just were like okay let's do this um and so I was 20 years old and so were they so you know we didn't have a lot going on and like a friend just like happened to still have a u-haul because she had like helped somebody like it just everything fell into place um and they just helped me pack up my stuff i didn't know where i was gonna go um so i just crashed on the, the couch of a friend and so i left and i left him a note saying like i'm sure this is a shock to you you know you go away for the weekend and you come back and your girlfriend's gone and all of her stuff <laughs> um so i was like i get it this is shocking but it's what it needed to happen and i still love you and i'm not trying to hurt you but please just give me a couple days and we can talk. I'm safe. I'm fine. But like, this is, this is not happening anymore. I'm leaving. So what happened next? How did you take it? He freaked out so I guess from what he later told me is he showed up and didn't notice the note at first. He just noticed that a bunch of belongings were gone. And so I guess he thought we had been robbed. So he like ran around frantically in the apartment, then saw the note, um, ignored my request and just drove around the city knocking on the doors of like anyone who knew me even people who knew me like peripherally like a friend's parents I'm like how did you even know where they lived and really was just like pleading begging getting angry saying like I know you know where she is where is she uh and so my friends ended up kind of moving me from place to place like, okay he just came to her house so we can bring her to that place and like just really kind of moving me around for about a day or so until I thought maybe I'll just call him and like reassure him that like, hey, I'm good. You're not listening. You're freaking people out. So I called him from a payphone at like a 7-Eleven. Um, and I think it was like the very next day. Of course, he knew where I worked. He knew all these things. He knew what my car looked like. Um, so I came out to a note on my car describing every single place I had been since I'd left him um, and tracing the exact payphone that I had called him from. And that's when I knew, like, oh, okay, this uh, this is irrational behavior and uh, dangerous. What were your friends telling you? Were they giving you advice? Were they, I mean, obviously they were helping you, but what were your friends' thoughts on this? Because I think they could see that I was equally equal parts afraid and also trying to minimize and like trying to rationalize what he was doing. And so they were very much like it was not it was very black and white for them like they didn't they couldn't understand why i would still care about him why i would care about what happened to him why i would hesitate in calling the police because like don't you want him to get in trouble like they had a very yeah like a very you need to stay away from him he's trying to manipulate you into talking to him and you need to not do that i think it's interesting that you didn't want to call the police right away because you don't want to make him more mad I don't think they really understood that like this is going to provoke him even further and I think and I've talked about this with other women in my work and so I know it's I'm not alone in this but there's just something about picking up the phone and saying it out loud 
that is like you can't be in denial any further you know like if i say the words like i'm being stalked by my ex-boyfriend then like i have to sit with the fact that that's real once you're broken up and you had left what types of stalking was he doing so he really ran the gamut because again not only did we you know date for two years we worked in the same place so he had tons of opportunity to Um, Like, he knew everything about my life, right? Like, he knew where I went to school. He knew where I worked. He knew who my friends were. He knew where they lived. So everything from, you know, constant phone calls, like constant, constant phone calls, um, email, because, again, there wasn't too, too much social media at the time. Like, Facebook wasn't even around or anything. But it was, like, a lot, like, just, like, incessant emails that, again, would run the gamut from, why are you doing this to me? Like, you bitch. Like, I was so good to you. Like, to... I miss you so much. I can't live without you. Um, He would routinely send flowers to my door. He would send random gifts. He left notes on my car. He harassed me at my workplace. He harassed my colleagues. You know, he would call me saying he was going to kill himself. He once left a will on my doorstep saying he was going to kill himself and make it look like an accident. And I would have to sit with the reality that, like, I had forced him to do this. Uh, And I ended up moving a total of three times. And he would always figure out where I lived. Uh, And at one point, he actually moved into the apartment complex behind my house so that he could watch me from his window. Do you know what else was going on in his life during this time? Um, He ended up losing his job, I think partially because his boss was like, I can't be responsible for what you're doing. He would just like leave his work to come and harass me or be on the phone with me the whole time he was at work. Um, So he was always between jobs. He was always trying to find a place to live where he could afford to live because he was always between jobs. Um, And I think he just was feeling pretty lost. Like he was 20. He was, his initial plan was to just take a gap year. So he had a high school education in a big city that's quite expensive to live in. Couldn't hold down a steady job. Didn't really have a lot of friends. Um, So I think he just had a lot of time to spend hunting me down and obsessing about what I was up to. Do you think he was jealous of your life or do you think he was just trying to covet and control you? I think it was both, honestly. Like, I think he resented the fact that I was living my life and was seeing some success in that. Like, I was in university on scholarship. Um, I you know, had a very full social life. I had a, so I think he was envious of the fact that like, oh, she's got a lot going on for her. And I'm just like a loser who works at the mall. Like, I just think he just was resentful that I was making my life happen and he was not. Um, But I think fundamentally his problem was entitlement. He was a fairly wealthy, you know, came from a fairly wealthy, very well-to-do family. He was white, good looking, um, in you know in the Canadian context he was also you know a really good hockey player (laughs) um so he played like you know pretty intense high level hockey growing up which brings a lot of its own kind of pizzazz in terms of women love that you know like he just no one ever said no to him and how long then was he stalking you from the time you broke up to the time you finally turned to the police I called police within days of the behavior starting um and I called 911 because I just assumed that's what you do um and the dispatcher was very clear in saying like oh like is he outside your door right now and I was like no but like he sent me these notes and they're like oh well if he's not outside your door right now that's not an emergency so they sent me to kind of one of their direct office numbers someone took my information down and had like a very blase attitude of well did you break up with him or did he break up with you? And I said, oh, no, I broke up with him. And she was like, oh, well, he's just heartbroken. Like, he's just sad. I mean, it's been a couple days. Like, relax, basically. He has a right to be upset. And it's early days. You're, like, kind of jumping the gun a bit on this. Um, but, you know, we'll get an officer. I'll, you know, I'll sign this to a detective. And they'll decide whether or not to pursue it. But in the meantime, here's a case number. Anything else that he does, no matter how small or insignificant you think it is, just call give us your file number and we'll just add things to your file. Um, Shortly thereafter, an officer did call me and again, had like a very blase attitude of like, hey, what's going on here? Um, Oh, he's only 19. Oh, he has no criminal record. Oh, you dated. Oh, it's been, you know, 72 hours since you broke up with him. Like, oh, okay. Well, I'll like call him. Like just like literally that was the tone. Just like very like, I'll call him. 
tell them to leave you alone, but like, I'm sure it's fine. And so they did. And they called me back. And I'm like, oh my God, he was crying. He was so upset. I don't think that he's a threat to you, but I was very clear to him that he needs to leave you alone. If you hear from him again, give me a call. But like, I'm sure you're never going to hear from him again. I hung up the phone and within seconds, he called me and was like, you bitch, what are you doing? So that was the scariest, the first of the big scary moments for me was like, oh, you're not even afraid of the police. Or you think that like a phone call from police would be a bit of a, a wake up call, but it actually just, yeah, infuriated him further and really just poked the bear. How did that make you feel when police reacted that way? I just remember physically just like sweating profusely, just being so warm, so uncomfortable. And then I hang up the phone with this officer and I just like laid on the floor and just started like ugly crying, like just sobbing hysterically, feeling like so just like despair, just feeling like, oh my God, like he literally wrote me a letter and signed it with his name, like acknowledging that he was stalking me and you're not even taking this seriously. Like what's he got to do? Um, and what do I have to do? What do I have to do to, to get you to understand that this is really scary and I don't want this to happen? Um, and so then that disappointment just kept, every time I had any contact with police, it just reaffirmed how much they were letting me down. Like I never felt encouraged or supported by my interactions with police. It was very much kind of a sense that I was wasting people's time. But, but eventually what happened was... Um, you know, all the little helpers that we don't think about in the legal system did kind of come to my defense in the sense that, because again, I would call, add things to my file, call, add things to my file. You know, he came to my work or here's a note that he left me. And this woman said, you know, you've called like four times today or five levels. I said, yeah, I'm sorry. Like I was told to. And she's like, no, 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 you're supposed to. I just like, I cannot believe with the amount of evidence I see on your file that you have not had an officer come to your house and take a statement. Like, it, it doesn't make sense to me that you haven't had a statement taken. My suggestion is that you hang up the phone, you call 911, and you say he's coming to your house right now. And I was like, well, I don't know that he is. And she's like, that's what you need to say in order for them to take this seriously. And then she also said, you know, have you thought about getting a peace bond, which I had never heard of before. And she explained to me that it's a, a version of a restraining order that in Canada you can get without police involvement. So any citizen who feels harassed or threatened by someone can go to their local courthouse and request a peace bond, um, which would then force that person to adhere to conditions for uh, one year. And then after that year, it's not on your criminal record. It just kind of evaporates. And so I thought, oh, okay, like that's, that's what I want. I don't want him to go to jail. I just want him to like officially leave me alone. Um, and so I called police and they, you know, said what the operator told me to say that, you know, he's coming. I don't, he might be coming. I don't know, but I'm scared. Um, two officers came to my house. They took a statement. Yeah, it was a female officer, a male officer. He swept the apartment and kind of took a look around. She took my statement. I gave her all of the copies I had of the notes and the letters, and she went through all of them and then said, someone from victim services will be in touch with you to do a safety audit. So someone came a few days later to do a safety audit, um, and they just, yeah, walked through my apartment and had a very non-plussed attitude also of just like um well okay you have a balcony but you live on the seventh floor so like I doubt he's gonna climb up seven flights or like seven balconies and I'm thinking like well that's I'm glad you're confident because I'm not <laughs> um and just kind of like gave me some like information that was helpful so you know your bathroom is the only room in your apartment that has a lock so if he breaks in grab your phone hide in the bathroom call us right away and I vividly remember when they left, just like, oh, by the way, we just need some like details about him. And she asked how old he was. And I said, oh, at that point he was 19. And she said, oh my God, he's such a baby. And I was like, yeah. And in my mind, I'm, I'm like, so am I by your definition. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine we lived in a world in which 19 year olds were incapable of harming others. Like, um, and so again, like, even though they were going through the paces and that's really kind of the vibe I got from the legal system of like, well, let's go through the paces cause we have to, but like, I'm not too worried. I'm not investing a lot of energy in this. So again, it just confirmed, like, I'm going to go through these paces, but it's not going to help me. Um, I'm just doing it because it's what I'm told is the right thing to do. So they just weren't taking you seriously. 
No. And then eventually when I went to go through the peace bond process, I discovered that um, he or whoever is being served gets served in the middle of the day, which means at their work, which is obviously going to provoke someone. So here he was at the mall. Everybody knows him. Someone um, tells him in 10 days you have to appear in court. Um, and at that point, there were no conditions on his behavior. So, like, there was literally nothing stopping him from coming to my house every day for 10 days, calling me incessantly, emailing me incessantly. And it was very much that roller coaster of, like, please don't do this to me. Um, we can work this out to you're going to ruin my life. You're going to give me a record. Like, you're exaggerating. Nah, nah, nah. Um, and so I was really torn on what to do. It felt unsafe to go ahead with it. It felt scary. Instead, the day of our court trial, he showed up at my house uh, and said, get in the car and come with me and tell them no or else you're not coming home. So I acquiesced because I wanted to live. And so I remember I had like pulled together like the best thing I could pull together that looked like a suit. Um, and he showed up and like he did manual labor, um, like he did repairs and stuff. So his hands were filthy. He had like an old ratty shirt on, Adidas slides, like just didn't care. And so we show up and you just, you show up at 9 a.m. and you just wait for course, the judge yeah. to call you because they just run through people all day long. And so we sat there for what felt like hours. I truly have no idea how long it was. Um, they called us up and I said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm here to revoke my request. And immediately it was a panel of uh, justices of the peace, which is what we call them in Canada. And they were like, oh, I knew you weren't afraid of him. You showed up here with him. Um, you know, this is a waste of the court's time. There are real women who experience real violence and you've taken a spot away from them. Your family must be like a, your family. Something about like my family should be ashamed of me. Like just like this awful, dramatic, like I'm going to make an example out of you. Um, which was truly the most humiliating experience of my entire life. And so we just walked out and he dropped me off at work. And I just remember before we left, he's like, you did good, babe. And just like dropped me off at work. And that was it. And so then when the police called me a few weeks later um, to be like, hey, we saw that you didn't go through with the peace bond, but like we want to go ahead with laying charges. They didn't do the proper protocol, which I now know is what you're supposed to do, which is you call someone, you ask them, is it safe for them to talk? Um, and they didn't create that opportunity for me. And so when they called me, Xavier was in my house. And so he was literally standing in front of me. And so I just was like, yeah, 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 no, everything's fine. And I remember the officer said to me, you know, I've worked with men like this before. He will not stop until he kills you. And I said, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm, you know, things are settling down and I, I feel like I got a good grasp on it. So I'm good. Thank you so much for your help. And I hung up. Um, and then I never heard from police again and I never even bothered to reach out because I thought now they're definitely not going to take me seriously because I denied it all and had my opportunity and I, and I quote unquote wasted it. And that was within the first year or so, not even of the stalking. Um, and it went on very intensely for another five to six years. Um, and the stalking in total went on for 10 years. And so even when he went on to do heinous, heinous things that I absolutely could have gotten charges laid and I, a conviction even, um, I, I just never bothered to call them again because I just was like, they're not going to help me. So why am I going to make this worse? I got to do this on my own. What were some of the things that he was doing during this 10 years of crazy stalking? I moved three times in total. Um, he constantly called me constantly called me um constantly was leaving notes at my door at one point i lived alone um in a really lovely apartment but it was a walk up in a pretty shady neighborhood so it was me and a lot of um, older folks and new canadians and even though i had warned people like please do not let this guy into the building they didn't see him as a threat um, he basically charmed them all and i remember in particular one of my elderly neighbors thought it was so romantic, like chivalry's not dead, you know, because he would show up with these flowers and he would leave candy and he would leave like teddy bears and all of this stuff that's on my door. And so she really took it as like, oh, this man is like stopping at nothing to woo this woman. He once called me while he was driving frantically down the highway saying he was going to crash into um, the median and kill himself and that I had to, you know, I had to walk him off the ledge. 
he uh, then when social media and like kind of being online picked up more, he hacked into my online banking. He would um, try to hack into any kind of form of social media that I had. So, you know, when Facebook came along um, and then as my career grew, like I, I kind of lived this parallel life where I started becoming more and more prominent in my work for women's rights. And so I would be in the news and then he'd be in the comment section. And then by about the five year mark or so, I felt like, oh, I'm not hearing from him as much. Uh, and that's when I heard that the rumor kind of from back home that he had moved away from Ottawa. And so I thought, oh, okay, at least now he's not physically in my realm. Um, but yeah, it was just like constantly contacting me online. And then at one point it seemed to be pretty quiet and I thought maybe this is done. Like maybe he's like dated someone else now and he's like moved on with his life. And so I remember saying to my friends, we made this pact of like, okay, if it's a year, if I don't hear from him for a year, then we can all say it's done. And it's like the second I put it out into the world, I not only heard from him more, but also every single year on my birthday, he would send me a message. And so it was like, I would start the clock over every year on my birthday of like, okay, a year from now. And then it was like, and then I would still hear from him. So um, it was truly just like the foreground of my life for 10 years. Did you ever um, reply to any of this correspondence or was he just sending it and you would get it and react? I tried being nice to him in the hopes that that would calm him down a little bit, right? And be like, I'm not your enemy. Like, I'm not trying to ruin your life. I just want to live mine. So I would try to be compassionate towards him and then that wouldn't get him to stop. So then I would try being mad at him and that wouldn't stop. And then I would try just ignoring him. And so I just, I tried everything in the, I tried getting other people to talk to him. Um, but yeah, it was probably like four years, three to four years before um, I just was like, I, it doesn't matter how much he tries i'm just not going to respond but of course that was a hell of a lot easier to do once he didn't live in the same city if when it was online correspondent it's a lot easier to i mean it's still difficult but it's a lot easier to just be like put it in the folder and ignore it versus like i'm coming out of a grocery store and he's like at my car waiting for me you know um like it's just so hard not to scream at that person because that's your instinct you know <laughs> like he had a lot of people enabling him um, people that he knew in real life clearly who helped him find me but also people just on the internet who believed his nonsense and even back home in our community like he had everybody convinced that I was just a bitter um woman who you know does this work on women's issues so she clearly hates men now and she's trying to make an example out of me and he had everybody convinced um that I was the problem and that's I mean that's classic abuser tactics right like they're extremely charming extremely manipulative um and they're very good at at, at wrapping people around their finger and he was no exception when did the stalking finally end? The stalking ended with his death in a car crash. So he died instantly in a single vehicle car crash about five years ago. Uh, and that is when everything came uh, to a head. <laughs> and it's also when I decided to come forward uh, and talk about my story. So again, I was very, and still am, very lucky. I have a, a platform in Canada where I talk about these issues on a national stage all the time. I've trained the prime minister on how to respond to violence against women. Like I have so much opportunity to talk about this stuff and I never did um, because I just felt it was too scary. It would provoke him. Even if I talked about it in vague terms, he would know I was talking about him. Um, it would, and I think that's the thing that people need to understand is like, we're not gonna have a me too moment around stalking. Um, because by definition, talking about it makes it worse. Unless he's dead or in jail, you're poking that bear. And so I think that's one, I think it's so important, the work that you're doing to highlight this issue because there's so few of us that can talk about it safely. Um, but also, yeah, I, it was shocking to a lot of people when I came out about my story. And I, and I think that's why I was privileged enough to have a platform to be asked to write a book, to you know do all this media about it because people were just so shocked that this woman that they had seen on television I mean I took on the Canadian military I like I changed legislation in Canada like I did all these things and so people thought I was this like badass woman that like took nothing from nobody and meanwhile I was like actually no I'm terrified every day of my life and if that could happen to me then you know what's happening to a hell of a lot more people because um we're just really good at hiding it so that was a, a very like his death also kind of propelled me uh into the public spotlight talking about this 
Uh, when you first heard about his death, like what was that? What was it like when you first heard it? It's another one of the very vivid memories I have. I was waiting. I had just finished doing television, actually, about sexual violence in the military because shortly before Xavier's death, I took on the Canadian Armed Forces because I was sexually harassed while I was training them on how to not harass people. Uh, and so it became a national news story and I was all over the media. Um, I couldn't speak in public without a police presence because I got death threats everywhere I went. So it was like this high intensity moment. Um, and I was asked to do media about it, was done, thought like, okay, this was the worst part of my day. And I was just scrolling social media, waiting for, um, my bus. And someone sent me a Facebook message, someone that I knew from back home, um, who knew and who believed me. And, you know, anyone who's had someone pass away that they went to high school with knows that like social media blows up right away with people telling their stories of how, you know, remember him and. And so she's like, I don't want you to find out that way. So I just want you to know that um, he died this this morning in a car accident. And I I remember looking up and it was like rush hour. And I remember looking up and everything was just like happening in super slow-mo. And I just wanted to like, like it was the most surreal experience of my life. Like truly the most shocking thing that has ever happened to me. Um, and I just wanted to like grab someone's shoulder and just be like and yell in their face like Xavier's dead. Like I just, I couldn't wrap my head around it and so my friend came to pick me up and I I swear I spent 24 hours just being like Xavier's dead Xavier's dead oh my god Xavier's dead like I just couldn't believe it it was just so surreal uh and that feeling didn't go away for months like it took probably over a year for me to actually like believe it um because it just was so shocking and people had these views that like things were over and I was like no you don't understand like I left this person when I was 20 he died when I was 30 I don't know what it's like to be a human being in the world without this person watching me like I don't know what it's like to just be an independent woman in the world like I was like I'm having an identity crisis almost you know like I just was like who am I um without this yeah it was a very weird space to be in and like bless the people around me they just didn't understand it they just were like shouldn't you feel the best you've ever felt and i felt the worst i'd felt in years like truly lost just so lost what made you decide to write the book after he died i took to twitter like a true millennial and like went on a twitter rant to be like hey people this is very real and I've worked in this sector for years and we never talk about stalking and like, why not? Cause we're out there. Uh, and then um, I was approached by a local paper or I'm uh, sorry, a national Canadian paper called the Globe and Mail because at the time the big debate in Canada uh, was whether or not consent should be taught in schools. And so I made the link from my story to, to talk about that and say, this is why we need to talk about consent. We need to talk about boundaries. Uh, and so I was profiled in this, in the paper, it was this big, like two page spread. They actually included me holding one of the threats that he had sent me, uh, in this like full color spread. It was just like so bizarre. And then I got asked to write the full article, a full piece for a fashion magazine. So I wrote like a 2000 word piece and I thought that's it. Like that felt so difficult to do that. I was just like, okay, hey, I've done it. Like it's out in the world. Um, and then I was approached by an agent who really wanted me to write a book and I said no and then he kept being like I really think there's a story here I really think there's an appetite so that's and I just really didn't want to do it and then finally I thought you know maybe it will be helpful for others maybe there is some good in this um and so that's why I decided to do it what did your friends and family think of the book um well some of them won't read it <laughs> um and I get it uh, it's hard, but I get it. And I was very clear when the book came out that everyone, you know, had to buy it to support me, but they didn't have to read it. <laughs> um, and in large part, it's because I knew that I would have to do a lot of handholding for people. Um, and I saw that kind of previewed when I wrote this 2000 word piece that went viral, that a lot of people in my life, it, it ended up like I was supporting them through their feelings about it, like them just being like so sad for me and also feeling guilty that they weren't there for me. And like, and so I, I told, yeah. So I told people like, if you're going to read it, that's up to you. But like, I can't help you talk. Like I can't walk it, it through with you because it's too hard. Like, um, and I understand that it's hard for you to hear, but it was my life, you know? Um, but 
overall very supportive. I, I mean, I have to give a special shout out to my dad in particular, who, you know, my parents screwed up in a lot of ways. And I wanted to tell that story because my parents meant well. They absolutely meant well. I have very, very loving, supportive family. They just didn't know what to do. And so they failed me in a lot of ways. And and I wanted to talk about that in the book so that other people, other parents could see, like, don't make the same mistake they did. And, you know, I think if my family had said no, I probably wouldn't have done that. But my dad in particular was just like, no, like people, how else are they going to learn, you know? And so I w- I'm very grateful that everyone in my life who's in the book was absolutely supportive of me being honest about the great things they did, but also the times they failed me. I think what was so hard for the for me in writing the book is that I'm I was so vulnerable in acknowledging not just like these are the facts, but also like this is what it did to me. Um, I have chronic physical health problems because I lived under stress for so long. I like, you know, have to take medication to help me sleep. So I think those are the parts that really for the people who know me made it like, oh, this woman is really good at looking resilient. Um, but that doesn't mean that she's not suffering. And I think that's the piece that made people really be like, oh, you're you're more than just the stoic face on TV talking about this in black and white terms. You're someone who like literally your physiological my like my physiological makeup is different as a result of the trauma I experienced. Like my brain chemistry is different as a result of what happened. Like that's how intense these things are. Um, and I think seeing that spelled out in the book hit home really hard for them. I think more than any other part of the book, it was just the like, this woman has suffered and she's just really good at faking it. I think it was only when he died and I came forward that I really sat with how much of a hypocrite I felt like. I felt like here I was telling women every day in my workshops, every day on the news, like stand in your power, stick it to the man, like you deserve better. And I wasn't able to do that for myself. Um, And so I felt like, was my work inauthentic? Um, I don't think that now, but it's certainly how I felt at the time. Like I felt like I was a hypocrite. And I also had to really contend with kind of my feelings of resentment that people around me hadn't been there for me. And then realizing it's because they didn't know how bad it was. Um, And so it's like, can I blame somebody for not checking in when I was giving all signals that like my life was on the up and up, my career was rising. And I think people just thought, well, she's not talking about it. And she's going to work every day. And she's like living her life. So she must be fine. And so I was just like, why weren't you there for me? But then I'm like, oh, it's kind of my fault. Because I didn't tell you how bad it was. So how are you to know to check in? Have you had other survivors reach out to you? Absolutely. Um, I was able to have two launches and it was, you know, hour or more of waiting in line to get a book signed. And if not every person, then every second person had it happen to them or knew someone that it had happened to. Um, and so that was a really intense experience to like bear witness for people but also just like doing it over and over and over again um i i get emails from women a couple times a week um saying that you know they heard about my story and either thank you or help like at least two three times a week i get some contact from someone who's saying i'm the police are not helping me or you know now he's trying to fight for custody of our kids please help me can you please advocate for me or i want to go public and i don't know what to do Um, so it's a lot, (laughs) it's exacerbated because in Canada, we don't have a single organization dedicated to stalking, which blows my mind. Um, but we don't have, we don't have an organization whose job it is to take care of that work. We also don't have an easy, uh, line of communication. So, you know, my colleagues in the U S talk about, you know, if you're experiencing, um, doxing or someone attacking you online, like you call the FBI and you, We don't have that in Canada. Like you have to call your local police detachment and assume that they know what the heck they're talking about. So there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of gaps. And so I'm I'm kind of seen as this resource person, which I'm happy to do when I can, but it feels like a lot of responsibility. Now that you've gone through this whole experience, what's some advice that you would give then to people going through this? I would say that... um, you know, like your silence is not weakness. And I think particularly in the context of Me Too, there's almost like a we're putting more responsibility on women to tell their stories. And if not, that like it didn't really happen to you or you're somehow not brave. Um, and I think there's a lot of responsibility that we're putting on women to like lay their trauma bare for, for it to be taken seriously. And so 
Um, you know, if you don't want to talk about it, if you don't want to publicly identify yourself as someone that doesn't mean you're a bad feminist or like you're doing harm to other victims, like you're doing what you need to do to survive. Um, and that, you know, if you're not believed, like it's the same advice I give to children who are experiencing sexual abuse, right? It's just like, tell, tell, keep telling until someone listens to you. Um, so if you are looking for help, whether it's legal, financial, housing, whatever, um, you're going to talk to a lot of apathetic people, but like, that's not a reflection of you. It's a reflection of the system. So where can we find your book, um, and your short film so my book resilience is futile is available um anywhere in anywhere you buy books in north america outside of north america you can only get it through um amazon or if you request it through an independent bookstore so through my publisher uh, btlbooks.com you can get it direct um, if you live in the states and i also created a five minute film uh, called outside of the shadows which is a free psa you can access it on youtube or outside of the shadows um, on our website. And it's just a short, uh, very beautiful animated five minute PSA um, where I tell my story just to kind of paint a picture of what stalking looks like and then transition to really practical tips for survivors and also their allies. So if you know someone and you're scared, how can you help them in a way that's actually helpful? Um, and there's also two posters that go with that that you can download for free. Um, one of them is if you're being stalked, here are some tips. And the other is if you know someone who's being stalked, here are some tips. Um, and so those are all just readily available. Uh, and my hope is that people continue to kind of spread it far and wide, because I think I am a testament to the fact that you just truly do not know who's going through this. And so even just posting something on social flags for them that this is something that you care about. And chances are that they'll reach out to you for help because they know they can trust you. Julie, what is next for you? My goal for uh, the next year is to create uh, a national organization dedicated to stalking here in Canada. Um, that would focus on giving practical resources to survivors. So um, whether it's through a support line or through some sort of chat function, um, but also really concentrating on prevention. That's my passion in all of my work is preventing sexual violence, preventing stalking, domestic violence. Um, and so creating resources for law enforcement, um, but also for women's shelters. Many women's shelters don't have the time to to learn all the new technologies that are used for stalking like they're just so busy trying to save women's lives that they don't know that like actually like the gps in her car could be what how he's tracking her or like her home security system is actually worse so, like they don't have the capacity to learn all this ever-evolving technology um and so i really want to work towards creating kind of a, a user guide and a training that can be constantly updated um because women's shelters are often on the front lines of this issue and they're just ill-equipped where can people find you to reach out if they want to talk about this? Yeah, so I'm always happy to hear from folks. So if you're on Twitter, I'm at Julie S. Lalonde on Twitter. Um, you can also find my website, Yellow Manteau, um, where is my consultancy and the work that I do as well. Um, but Twitter is the easiest way to find me. Um, and again, I'm grateful that I have that platform to reach out to people, but also um, a, a way for them to get in contact with me. So absolutely, if this is if this feels very real to you, um, I am here for you. If anyone out there is in need of help or is a victim of stalking, please reach out. You can find a list of resources at our Instagram at Strictly Stalking Pod. I'm Jake Deptula. And I'm Jamie Beebe. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Strictly Stalking. Mm-hmm.